A friend of mine told me the other day that after a recent church service, her son suddenly announced that he was going to be a minister when he grows up. And she said that was fine with her, but she asked him why he decided to become a minister. And he said, well, I have to go to church on Sundays anyway, so I thought it would be more fun to stand up and yell than to sit and listen. (laughs) Before we delve into this week's discussion, I'd like to thank you all for having me here for the past six weeks and for welcoming me into your wonderful church um, and for giving me a platform in which to stand up and yell while you all sit and listen. (laughs) You've all truly been a blessing to me, and I look forward to returning um, to bring you the message the last two weeks of August. Over the last four weeks, we've been focusing on Jesus as the real superhero. We've watched as he's healed the sick, restored life to the dead, walked on water, calmed the winds, cast out demons, and fed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two small fish. So compared to all those things, today's passage might seem a little anticlimactic, but that's exactly why I chose this scripture to end our series on. This is from the beginning of Mark, before any of those miracles take place, and yet it beautifully captures all that Jesus was and is and did and does. This passage provides the ultimate proof that Jesus is the only real superhero. He was then, he is today, and he always will be. So let's jump into this a bit by taking a look at the background. This passage takes place after John the Baptist has been put in prison. Now, we know that in the time before Jesus began preaching, John the Baptist had been preaching about the time to come. By the time we get to the Gospel of Mark, John's message of repentance is over, and it's time for Jesus' message to begin. Now, John had been preaching about the time to come, and Jesus was now preaching that the time had come. John preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, and Jesus preached that the kingdom itself was at hand, so believe the gospel. John did not preach the gospel. He preached that the gospel bearer was coming. See how it all fits together? Pretty cool, huh? Jesus had been through a lot up to this point, including his 40 days in the desert, being tempted by Satan, and just prior to this, he was baptized by John the Baptist, and the heavens opened above him, and a voice said, this is my son, in him I am well pleased. Some versions of the Bible say, you are my son. Either way, it's clear that this is a pivotal time in Jesus' life and ministry. So John is in prison, and now Jesus is the messenger. Now let's poke around a little in Jesus' message. Jesus preached the gospel the good news that God had fulfilled his promise to Israel by sending the Messiah to save the people. Messiah, as you probably know, means anointed one. The name Christ means the same thing. So when we call him Jesus Christ, we are acknowledging him as God's anointed one. And anointing, by the way, was really important in biblical times. Anointing someone with oil was a sign that God was consecrating or setting them apart for a special purpose. So an anointed one was someone with a special God-ordained purpose. In the Old Testament, people were anointed for the positions of prophet, priest, and king. God told Elijah to anoint Elisha to succeed him as Israel's prophet. Aaron was anointed as the first high priest of Israel, and Samuel anointed both Saul and David as kings of Israel. All of these men held anointed positions. But the Old Testament predicted a coming deliverer, chosen by God to redeem Israel. You can look this up in Isaiah. This deliverer is the one the Jews called the Messiah. Now, we could spend hours digging deeper into that, but I'm trying not to let myself get all derailed here. So Jesus is the anointed one, God's Messiah, But as a whole, the nation of Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah because he didn't fit the commonly accepted idea of what the Messiah would be like and would do. The Messiah was expected to lead the Jews to victory over the Romans, 
and bring Israel back to power in the world. But our superhero wasn't doing things that way. He gave no indication at all that he was that kind of Messiah. Yes, Jesus was a maverick, a revolutionary, but he wasn't the kind that Israel expected would defeat their enemies and return them to a place of dominance in the world. He was humble. He was nonviolent. He kept breaking Jewish laws, which was a big no-no. The Jews have always believed that the Messiah would come from the line of David, and while Jesus does, that's about all he does that fits their preconceived messianic molds. If the Jews were expecting another King David, they sure weren't going to recognize Jesus, were they? Incidentally, this is one of my little asides that I like to share with you. Mark doesn't mention this, but Matthew tells us that even John the Baptist had started to wonder if Jesus was really the one sent by God. But our superhero was the Messiah sent by God. We know that now. Yes, he was different from the one the people at that time expected, but that's because God's purpose in the world was different from what the people expected. The people of Israel expected God to vanquish their enemies and to make their nation great. But God's purpose was to make a new covenant with the people. This is what we remember when we take communion, when we echo Jesus' words that the cup is the new and eternal covenant God made in his blood. I sometimes think we hear the words of communion so often that sometimes they don't really sink in anymore. So let me say that again, because this is big. The Old Testament often talks of God's covenant with Israel. Everyone else would have been outside of that covenant. Jesus came to bring the rest of us into that covenant, to rewrite the covenant so that we are all included. This is why Jesus is the anointed one, the chosen one, the Messiah. The cup from which we take communion is the eternal symbol of that new covenant. I'm starting to get all stand up and yell here, so let's get back to our story. Today's passage tells us that Jesus has come to Galilee and is on a mission. In Jesus, the time that was prophesied in Genesis 3, chapter 15, was being fulfilled. Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, has come. So Jesus came on a mission, and he came with a message. He came bearing the good news of a gracious God. He came telling sinners to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance and faith are his message, and these two words encapsulate an eternity of truth. If it weren't for Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, we wouldn't have repentance and faith in the first place. It's because of Jesus that we do. Now let's talk for a minute here about repentance and faith. We're sinners. We know this. We are guilty in front of a holy God. Faith shows us that we aren't saved from this sin by anything within ourselves, not by anything that we alone can do or say. We have no bargaining chips with God. We've sinned. We're guilty. But faith turns our gaze from ourselves to Jesus. We can't save ourselves. It's like grabbing a tree branch to pull yourself out of quicksand only to have it snap off in your hand. But when we turn to our faith and grab hold of Jesus, we're saved. It's what we talked about last week. Jesus came to tear away all the things that separate us from God. Repentance is turning away from our sins. Faith is believing that Jesus can redeem us. So repent and believe the gospel is the message Jesus brings to us here. These are two powerful theological truths, and they are bound together like they're stuck with spiritual crazy glue. You can't have one without the other. Now, let's get back to the Israelites. They overall rejected the idea that Jesus was the anointed one, and for all the reasons that we've already discussed. He didn't fit what they were expecting. 
But you know God, he didn't let that stop his divine plan. So right smack in the middle of Israel's rejection of the Messiah he sent, God chose to bring all sin to a head and destroy it once and for all. That, my friends, was the crucifixion. That, my friends, was the resurrection. A lot of times in superhero movies, the hero finds he has to sacrifice himself to save humankind. But in these stories, the hero doesn't usually die. In our story, he does. In that act of turning the ultimate human rebellion and rejection of himself into the means of salvation, God not only fulfilled his promises to Israel, but to all of us. Jesus' preaching is about the gospel of God, or the good news about salvation that is both from God and about God. Verse 15 sums up the essence of his message. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. This means that now, in Jesus, God is busting into history to fulfill his promises and bring his whole big amazing plan to completion. You want to know why I call Jesus the real superhero, the ultimate superhero? It's because Jesus is the one God sent to do this. When Jesus begins his public ministry in Galilee, it's a decisive moment. It's a turning point. God determined that moment long ago and fixed it as the beginning of salvation history. This is huge. For the kingdom to come, there must be a two-part human response, and this is found in the rest of what Jesus says. Repent and believe in the gospel. I find it absolutely amazing that with everything that we've read about Jesus and all that we know about Jesus, it can be summed up in this short passage from Mark. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The prophets carry this same theme throughout the Bible, and John the Baptist echoes it as well. But when we look at it really closely, we see that Jesus gives it a personal touch and invites us to believe, to believe and accept and surrender to what God is doing through him. How beautiful is that? Now let's talk for a moment a bit more about the phrase, the kingdom of God. This is another one that the theologians love to banter around. It shows up a lot in the Gospels, and it's a term that Jesus often uses to explain what he's all about. But his announcement that the kingdom of God is at hand has both a present and a future quality about it. I kind of think of it like when the sun is just starting to rise and you can see that orange on the horizon, but the sun isn't quite up yet. It's there, but it's not quite there. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, what does he really mean? How can Jesus say the kingdom of God is at hand when what's actually at hand is that the Romans are going to crucify him and the Jews are still going to be persecuted and the temple is going to be destroyed? Here's what I think is the answer to that. The kingdom of God is at hand because Jesus is the bringer of that kingdom. We can experience the kingdom and follow Jesus' admonition to repent and believe. When you repent and believe, you actually change your life and experience a new way of living because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Crucifixion takes care of the punishment for sin. Death is defeated. But the resurrection, the resurrection is where the rubber meets the road here. The fact that Jesus lives means we don't have to do this alone. The kingdom of God is still at hand because Jesus is here, now, today, with us. Jesus is alive so that we may repent, believe the gospel, and fully experience the kingdom of God. And that, brothers and sisters, is why I say that Jesus Christ is the real superhero. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand if you are able and join us in singing hymn number 213, Because He Lives. <laughs>